Hi, I'm Joe Johnsick, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. Being a pilot, from what I understand, what I've learned so far, it's easy when you're flying straight and level and everything's working right. But when things go wrong, push comes to shove, you got to know what you're doing. Pastor Joe is great in flying a jet, but he's also being great in being a pastor mm -hmm. and guiding this church. And things yes. are great when the outside environment's great, the news is all happy and fine and dandy, but that has not been that way the past year. And thank God that we have a pastor who relentlessly seeks after him more so than he said he's to fly the airplane uh, to make sure everything in this church stays stable, stays strong, and stays safe. Um, yeah. We miss him. We were happy he'll be getting trained to be back next week, but we're so honored to be here with you guys. And we know it's a huge blessing to have a pastor that is so great. So there's a lot of things to where I feel like I tell everybody all the time, it's being spoiled, being married to you. Because if I ever well, have yeah. a question, I just pick his brain because he's a plethora of knowledge. And when we're here on Sunday, it's him taking a nugget of like 365 days of the year of knowledge into one day. And so I always try like, to pick his brain because I think he's one of the smartest people that I know. <laughs> you know, and going along the line with what he said is knowing how to respond in an emergency situation. And that's what we're talking about today as far as worship and praise is concerned. You know, because um, I'm at the point, I'm not a legal licensed pilot. I'm still working. I'm still a flight student pilot. But I'm at the point now where he's in Texas and I'm signed off and I'll go solo by myself while he's in Texas. I'll fly around and things are great. And you know what? I've never lost an engine until he's sitting in the airplane with me. <laughs> and we'll be over Manchester. They do it on purpose. They don't actually lose an engine. We'll be just over Manchester and Ashua and he'll, he'll look around and be like, okay. And he'll put his hand on the throttle and yank it down and say, you lost your engine. And I'm not allowed to touch the throttle. And he keeps his hand there to make sure I don't. So now I'm flying an airplane without any, any engine, and the emergency response is flaps up, hold 72 knots. And every time it happens, that's what my brain goes back to. So when you're hit with these life scenarios, with the way everything's been going the past year, what's your emergency procedure? What do you go back to? Are you going to what you see on social media? Are you going to what you saw one pastor say or this pastor say, even though they're two opposite things? Or are you going to be rooted in the Word of God, and are you going to be rooted in praising and worshiping Him? What's your emergency procedure? Where are you? That's what we're talking about today. Yeah, so we're talking a lot about worship, and so... We're going to start out just by talking about what we're created to do. So I'm going to read a verse in Acts and kind of give you the backstory. I'm not as fancy as pastor, so I'm not going to read the entire story to you, but I'm going to give you a backdrop of what's going on. So here in Acts, we have Paul talking to the church, and what he found out is that they've been worshiping an idol, of an unknown idol. They didn't even know what they were worshiping. They just knew that they wanted to worship something, so they had an unknown idol that they had been worshiping. And Paul finally goes up to them, and he says, from one man, Adam, he made every man and woman, and every race of humanity, he spread us all over the earth. He sets the boundaries of people and nations, determining their appointed times in history. He has done this so that every person would long for God, feel their way to him, and find him. For he is the God who is easy to discover. It is through him that we live and function and have our identity, just as our own poets have said, our lineage comes from him. So kind of just going back to basics here just a little bit, we're created in general, oh, you can, ready, how do I work this thing? Do I hit? Hit that arrow? Yeah, so we're created to search for God, to find him, and to worship him. And when we have that inherent desire, we simply want to find something to worship. So when Paul found that these people had been worshiping an unknown idol, he was like, hey, bozos, here's why you have that desire to worship. You were created specifically to do so. 
and going along with that. You know, we, as she just said, we're designed to worship. You are going to worship something or someone. You are going to be focused on worship. That's your DNA is what you were designed to do. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe, it talks about us and how we're being made together for a dwelling place of God and spirit, how the spirit of God is made and we're made so he can dwell inside of us. That's our DNA. It's, there's literally a part in our being, in our spirit, where God is supposed to be. The world doesn't always understand that, and sometimes Christians don't even understand that. So we try to fill it with what we want to fill it with, and it's easy to do if we're not careful. It's not always bad, but it can be bad. When you start idolizing what you love doing over the Father who created it all, that's when it gets bad. And we have to understand you are going to give your time, money, everything you are to something or someone, but you have to decide who or what is it going to be. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5, it says, don't be obsessed with money, but live content with what you have, for you always have God's presence. For he, hasn't he promised you, I will never leave you alone, never, and I will not loosen my grip on your life. He's saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. Do we understand what it actually means and what it actually entails to have God the Father, the creator of everything, say, I'm never going to leave you? Because I think a lot of times people use God as a cop-out and not the Father. They use him as, oh, God will handle this, which he will, but actually have no faith in saying that, and then their lives are no different than anybody else. But when people understand who God is and he's the father and he wants to know us intimately and we have that relationship with him, our lives change radically. Yeah, so the next part we're talking about is, is worship doesn't change who God is. It changes who we are the more that we worship. And I want, you to, I want that to set in for a second because nothing, we say this all the time, but nothing we could do more makes God love us anymore. So there's nothing more that we can do that's going to change how good he is. And when we worship, it doesn't change who he is. It changes us from the inside out. And so when it comes to this, this is where he kind of just started prefacing, talking about how whatever you worship, you're going to worship something. And I was kind of talking to him a little bit how there's a war on worship. And we are the last night talking about, anyways, we're talking about how there's a war for our worship. Because for many of you that don't know, fun fact, uh, the devil was actually God's worship leader before he Lost left orders. heaven and went to hell. <laughs> so the devil knows exactly what you're created to do. He knows how to worship, and he was one of the best worship leaders because he was the worship leader of heaven. And so the fact that if you're not choosing in your, what did you call this plan? This, what do you, pilots call it? Your emergency plan? That. Um, <laughs> emergency if, checklist. If that's not something that's your first go-to, there's going to be something that is. So one of the biggest things on here that I loved that when we were reading this is whatever you worship, you become. In other words, what you value most determines who you are. And I think when I was in college, I was told this over and over and over again, and I don't think I got it till I was like 23, but I got told all the time that you are the five closest people that you hang out with. And I always used to tell my mom, I'm like, no way, like that makes no sense. I have friends that make way worse decisions than I do, and I'm still fine. <laughs> and it was like an ongoing joke, and she goes, no, but really. And when I finally figured out that the people I was spending the most of my time with was developing the, the choices I would make or the goals that I would have, if I didn't have any friends that pushed me to be any better or to look to Jesus in my issues, and decide to just have a pity party with me for way too long, it just, it, it dawns on you. So, I mean, that kind of goes back to what we're talking about with worship is to where when it comes to what you're worshiping, it's, it's like he said, time, talent, and treasure. If that's what you're spending most of your time doing, that's what you can worship. And when it comes to worship, I feel like sometimes you can think of when we're talking about worship, you think songs, singing, how God, how great God is. But, you know, for somebody who doesn't like to, I, I love to sing, so not me, but for people that don't like to sing or people that singing or music isn't your thing, say if you are somebody who is a skateboarder or you like, you're an actor, things like that. When actors, I, I love Chris Pratt, so one of the biggest things is when he won some sort of award, he thanked God first. It's doing anything for God's glory. And so when you're spending more time with bad habits than you are with worshiping God and what you're doing, it can put a wedge in what God wants to do. And it can kind of prevent you sometimes from having a breakthrough that you've been wanting. And so when I say bad habits, sometimes 
And it's hard because I feel like the more we pray and the more we seek God, the more we worship and he points things out to us, you might realize things that are bad habits that you didn't realize were bad habits. <laughs> and so when we were talking with this, I was telling him sometimes when we have certain friends that have all different relationships, some, some friends that don't go to church, some that do, but one of the biggest things is when you can put your, is it your spouse and your kids before God. Mm -hmm. And if you're more worried about your relationship with your spouse than you are your relationship with God, my marriage will never work if I'm not worshiping God and putting God first. And my relationship, I'm not going to be, once I am a parent, I'm not going to be a very good parent. I'm doing them a disservice if I don't put God first before I put my kids. Uh, I was talking to Robin about this week because this week, we were joking about some of the parenting topics. And I was like, I sat in a Joyce Meyer service one time, and she flat out told her kids every morning, they asked her, Mom, why don't you come out and hang out with us in the morning before school? She's like, because um, your dad does that because I need Jesus to be a good parent to you. <laughs> My hours for Jesus is in the morning. And so it, it's just one of those things of what are your habits? I mean, this could be laziness, money. It could be food that you're spending more time on. I know that seems strange, but I mean, for me, it's really hard when I am somebody that loves sugar. That's just something that I love, and it's hard to have self-control. If you're spending hours upon hours on video games, but you have a hard time sitting down for an hour to pray, that can be one of them. Uh, social media, how long you're on your phone, Tons of this, and it, I mean, and when I say laziness, it can be, we're all guilty of wanting to be lazy every once in a while, that's not what I mean, but when there sometimes can be a spirit of laziness or being unorganized, it's some things that you're not naturally wanting to do, God can start, the more you worship God and the more he changes you from the inside out, he'll help you get things done that you want to get done to give him glory. He'll help you to get more organized if you need to get things in order in your house, things like that. So, as she was saying, going along the lines with that, you know, if, if you show me your friends, I'll show you your future in five years, is one of the famous sayings. What you hang around and what you indulge yourself in and around, that is who you are going to become, good or bad. And with worship, when we're, when we're understanding worshiping the Father and understanding that it's, it's not just singing a good song and getting goosebumps and thinking, wow, that chorus was so powerful, it felt amazing. There's a lot of bands from the 70s and 80s who have great courses that sound amazing, to be completely honest, and they don't serve God at all. But when we're actually with him and we're communicating with him and we're living with him, our lives will always, 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 always be radically different. Because why wouldn't you want to indulge yourself or be surrounded by his presence and be surrounded by his love and have your life just go from A to B so rapidly? Because God, when you come into church, if this is your first time or you're newer to this whole church thing and Christian thing, God is fine with where you're at, but he's not going to leave you there. He wants to make you better. And when we have a lifestyle of praise and we have the lifestyle of worship and understanding that it goes far beyond a song that makes you feel good by actually a dedication to who he is, your lives will never be the same and you'll be able to experience him and see him in ways you never thought possible. Yeah, so like we're saying, what you worship, you become. That's one of the biggest things that you can remember and take away from today. And one of the things is is I was reading this week, and one of the books that I have, I've, I've, I've reread it probably five times. And it's talk, when it's talking about the war of worship, it goes, you might think I'm just going to sit back, and if I'm just not doing certain things, then the devil's not going to really care. But it's, it's you being complacent and not worshiping. He'll find something little, step at a time, to fill your time that's not worshiping God. So whether you think it's no big deal or not, it'll add up over time. Psalm 22, verse 3 and 4, and this is what really kicked this whole thing off for me, because we were talking about what we want to talk about, and I'm a very, I'll get it later, type person. Lacey is a very, I want it now so I can plan it. So uh, Wednesday night, the, you who were at Wednesday night prayer, you all know who you are. It was great. The Holy Spirit said some things about worship, and that's kind of what kicked this off. And uh, Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, But you are holy, enthroned in your praises of Israel. The other word for enthroned there is dwell. God dwells in his praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. And that sounds great. But what I saw this morning about this verse is it's actually a checklist. There's something in there that shows you how to overcome anything you're ever put in. Because we have the authority. We love talking about authority. 
We have miracles, and we love talking about miracles. We have all these things we love talking about, but I think worship has been so dumbed down by the, I won't say average person, but what worship is supposed to actually be has been turned into a good song with goosebumps. And God's not... He doesn't hate you for it if you've never been taught this, but he's not happy that that's what worship is portrayed. So Psalm 22, verse 3, the biggest, the one, two, three checklist for these two verses are praise, trust, deliverance. You are holy and thrown in your praise. First off, Israel praises the Father. Regardless, it doesn't say when things were good. It doesn't say when things were bad. It says they praised him. And it says, our fathers trusted in you, they trusted in you delivered. Praising God, worshiping God will bring trust in him, and you will be able to be delivered out of what you're going through at that point. So another way to read this verse that I just wrote, it says in Psalm 22, verse 3, when we express our admiration, when we praise God, it causes us to believe in the reliability the truth, ability, and strength of God to rescue us. We trust him and set us free. We're delivered. Then we walk in complete freedom. If you really want to be free, if you really don't want to live in fear, if you're really tired of being sick and tired, praise him and worship him, and your trust will turn to him, and that trust in him will trust him to deliver you, and his deliverance will overtake your life, and you're going to be changed. I had to do it this week. I came on Wednesday because we can't listen to music really loud in our apartment. I mean, I could, but it'd be rude. But I just had a day where I was like, I just need to praise this out. (laughs) Like, I just needed. So we came a couple hours early, and even Robin was like, that music is really loud. But we have a good stereo system. Tell Dave I didn't mess with it, just in case he comes back and he's wondering. But sometimes you just need a second to just get yourself right, knowing that it's been an overwhelming day or that there's stuff that's filling your head, and you just need a second I mean, if anyone, anyone ever watched Grey's Anatomy in this room? No? Yes? Okay, fine. Not enough teenage girls, I guess, in this room. But um, one of the things they do in there is they dance it out half the time. And I mean, pretty much the same thing. Christian's not the same type of person I am, so he's like, I'll sit in the back of the room. So he stood in the back there, but I literally was jump. You'd think that I would have been in a youth service full of teenagers in this room with what I was doing in the room. But it doesn't matter what you do because it's your heart for worship and it's what you're doing that's changing you when you do it and knowing that you go to that first. And so the reason why we say that and and being energetic and what you're showing, it doesn't matter, but however you choose to worship, whether it's what you do or it's singing, whatever it is, people need to see your passion. And I'm, I'm so, it's so difficult when I was watching a video and it says, tell me you're a Christian without telling me that you're a Christian. And it's like, what are your actions? What are you doing? Do you even have passion for what you believe in? Do you even have passion for who you worship? And the reason why I thought about this, because I cry almost every time I watch this video and I didn't cry this time. It's true. She normally did, but she held it back. She probably held it back because I was asking her. But But if anyone has seen the movie, The Greatest Showman, it's amazing. If you haven't seen it, it's a musical. Christian hates musicals. And he even said it wasn't that bad. So if you watch it, it's amazing. But one of the things they had to do before this movie got approved, they had to go sing in front of a bunch of executives to get the movie greenlit. And one of the ladies that sings one of the anthems to the song was always terrified to step out from behind her music stand. And for every single song they sing during this, they're so full of emotions with what they're trying to do because they're trying to convince those people to give them a job pretty much. But they're so passionate trying to get their point across with the movie that they're trying to get. And that whole room, if I would have paused it and put no volume on there and played a worship song in the background, you would have thought that you were in a worship service with how passionate they were about what they were singing. And finally, she comes out behind from in front of her mu- from behind her music stand, and she owns the entire room with how passionate she is about what she's singing about. And I feel like sometimes we can get in our own heads or we can sometimes get stuck in what we're thinking or what's going on that week to when God's really saying, hey, remember who I am. Remember what I've already done. All you got to do is worship me for me when it comes to God. We don't have to worship him for anything that's gone bad that week. We don't have to think about it. All we're doing is all we have to think about is who he is and what he's already done. And people need to see our passion. Their lives are depending upon it. You're one second of passion. I always say 30 seconds of awkwardness is somebody's worth their eternity in heaven. And sometimes your passion's needed just for other people to see it. And before it hurt, I had even talked about that part. Again, you know, serving the Holy Spirit, serving God is just so good because 
your stuff lines up when you're in tune. So Friday morning, I got here early, just praying back and forth. And I simply said out loud to myself, because I like to examine or think about what I'm doing. I said, if I was to stop praying right now and never pray or talk ever again, would people notice a difference? And it's easy to say yes, because, well, I'm in front of you. But if you think about that in your life, if you stopped praying in your personal time, if you stopped reading, if you stopped worshiping, would people notice a difference? Yeah. Because are we showing people a God worth praising, or are we showing people a convenient God and we go to church once a week? Mm -hmm. And when we understand that God is a God worth praising and worshiping, and people see that, People will see that in your workplace. People will see that with your family and in your home. And when we understand that, worshiping, it will change the entire atmosphere. You know, especially men, we're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our household. It is how God designed us. If, if you don't know that yet, just say you are. Just speak it out. <laughs> so if you don't know that you're supposed to be, you are. <laughs> and I took uh, Lacey away. We went to Portland, Maine over the summer for her birthday just to get away. Oh, this is fun. a fun story. And we were at a campground, and they were doing this talent show. And I'm sitting there, and of course, I'm all spiritual. So I'm like, what if I just took the mic and started praying for people? I didn't do that, but that's what It was a terrible was. talent show. If my family's live stream watching, it was a funny campground, but it was terrible for the talent show. But we're sitting there. And this little girl, she had to have been, what, six, seven? Yeah. She gets up there, and she's doing... Uh, Backflips and cartwheels. And to Katy Perry. <laughs> and I sat there, and it's funny, but I leaned over to her, and I even told Pastor Joe late, later, I said, that little six-year-old girl had mo more boldness than most men in church who don't even want to get up and pray. And it's sad that that's what it's become. But guys, we're supposed to be the leaders. And if we're not praising and we're not praying and our wives and our children don't see us as that example, where are they going to learn it from? Yeah. And we've been married a, almost a year and a half, uh, a little over a year, well, not quite a year and a half, a year and a quarter. How's that? And that's been my biggest thing because when she was dancing and she was praising and I'm in the back there, watching your spouse enjoy God is just fun. Like, I was laughing, but in a good way, because here she is. You were laughing at me? <laughs> Look, I can't I get out of that, so, so I just got to move him. the subject over. I'm stuck, <laughs> and I understand that. So I'm in the back, and I'm watching her praise and dance and shout and just have fun. But, man, they need to see us do that, too. They need to see us on Wednesday night prayer leading and praying things out. They need to see you and your home take initiative. And one of the things I was praying about on Wednesday was boldness for men in the church. Because with the Holy Spirit, if you have them, comes boldness. Yeah. It was after the Holy Spirit came upon them in the book of Acts that the boldness happened where they were able to preach the word of God with boldness. So when, whether we're in the car, whether we're at home and nobody else is around, start praising God in your house, men specifically, if you don't already, your house will change. Things will shift and things will change. You know, growing up under Pastor Joe, I didn't want to turn a book the wrong way because the Holy Spirit would have told him. And I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's a snitch, but <laughs> parents, kids, if your parents are in tune with the Holy Spirit, be, be extra careful. Because they will get you in a car one time where there's no way out. My and own mother has told me horror stories. Well, not horror stories, but... And they'll ask you questions about what you're doing when they're not around. Yeah, my but siblings it, even had that happen. It makes things so much better because then that household is dedicated to the father and not what you want to do in your own personal time behind the scenes. Talking about all of these things, we're talking about you setting the tone for your, your house. You know, there's... Every house has an atmosphere. We're going to talk about this, too, in, in Family Month. And when you walk into a home, you can feel peace in the home and, and things like that. You just know what the climate is like in that house. This is my favorite part in this, but when it comes, before I talk about this point, 
when you're talking about your household, um, if, the, if the Karams are probably in here somewhere, but right you, there. if, if you haven't them. met the Karams, I can't see that far. If you haven't met the Karams yet, they have a, an adorable grandchild. And <laughs> I love hanging out with one of their children. And the, he, he literally is the cutest little nugget. But one time he was getting upset and his mom goes, hold on, let me just put on a song for him. And I, I'm here expecting, like, I told her, I'm like, I'm, if you put on Baby Shark, I'm going to, like, kill you. <laughs> and she, I start dying laughing because she goes to put on a Brandon Lake worship song that's like super heavy worship song, not an upbeat, fast praise song. And she goes, oh, yeah, worship music's the only thing that calms them down. <laughs> and have you, that's something they've already made as a tone in their house. And they're, they're our age. I mean, I just think that's such an awesome parenting style when it comes to your household is already on that tone of, no, we're going to worship, you're upset, and they know it calms them down. I just thought that was so funny. But when we're talking about the perspective change, which one did I put before this? I'm going to go back to that. So all of us know when you, when you go through certain things, it can, no, I'm going to go back to that too. It can definitely shift your perspective. And so last week was a really hard week for my family. We had a family member of mine pass away from COVID. And so it was extremely hard because there's somebody who was, it was my uncle and I was very close with him growing up. Um, he was a great human being and he was pretty much the same age as my parents. So it was definitely something that was scary. It was not fun. And then watching all of my cousins and their children, which were his grandkids, all be shattered. Um, and his youngest is only 16. And it was just very emotional. And it was something I didn't expect. And it definitely took me off guard. And my mom and I were pretty much, because all well, the COVID rules, I'm sorry, but I'm just so sick of them. <laughs> but the COVID rules makes it so our, our whole family wasn't allowed to go to the services, and there was a lot of rules for the wake, and we grew up in a small town, and he was a sergeant for the town, and so they shut down the roads so that we could get everywhere that we needed to, and the whole entire police department did stuff. It was just one of those moments to where my mom and I were in the car driving down, and my mom instantly, I think, like almost read my mind. I mean, she does this when she gets in the car every single day anyways. When we were growing up, we'd get in the car, and she'd be like, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it every single day. Every day we got in the car on the way to school. That's what was said. And we get in the car, and she immediately starts praying, and it was kind of what everybody in the car needed at that time. And then we listen to worship music the whole way there, the whole way back. And it shifts your perspective when you're going through things. Because I'm sorry, there's no way to shake the fact that death just stinks. There's no way around death that makes it easy. We're, we're human beings. There's no natural part of death to where you're ever happy that someone's dead. I'm sorry. It's just, it's hard no matter what. And when it comes to this, this is one of the biggest things. This is the second time now, I'm sorry, third time I've had somebody very close pass away to where the only reason that I got through it was because I had to shift my perspective and worship God even though I didn't feel like it. And it's one of those things, that, and my mom even said it in the car to where she goes, you know what, sometimes this song comes on, and I just need to hear it because and be reminded how good God is. And usually it's right at the perfect time when I need to hear it that it comes on the radio that I hear it. And that's what songs and that's what worshiping and what the words and the lyrics can do that's talking about who God is. That's how powerful it is. It can shift you from seeing a whole situation completely different to where sometimes you, it's like when you have tunnel vision and you can only see things one way it's almost because it's like we talked about what you worship it changes you so the more you worship the more you're seeing who God is and who he is as a person inside and out and the more you're becoming like him well the more you become like him the more you start to see people how he sees them instead of how you see them and so it's shifting your perspective in ways that you can never imagine but last week that's just my last week and then through this whole year I feel like of weirdness of what 2020 was. It was just, there were songs that I had to have as an anthem to say, nope, I'm declaring this because we, I did have family members that were afraid and still are. And then I do have people that it's sorry, it just stinks. And, and it is, it's fine to talk about somebody when they've passed away, but it's another thing when you're talking about people's legacy and it, and it makes you think, what legacy are you leaving? And, and this uncle of mine, he was, I mean, my mom always needed babysitters for me. She worked like two jobs when I was little. So I always, with my cousins, we were always at their house. He would always buy me whatever pizza I wanted. <laughs> he would literally every single time, same pizza place. And one time my mom and I got in a really bad car accident. And at the end of the day, 
he found us a car, and I think, I'm almost positive he gave it to us and didn't even make my mom pay for it. And it's just one of those things to where you talk about the legacy that someone leaves, and it makes you think, well, what's my legacy? What am I doing for people? What am I showing them? What am I saying on a regular basis? Am I shifting my perspective, or am I walking around feeling bad for myself and going to sit here in my pity party? You know, and again, and I don't know why I just keep going back to it, but I really do, is just men being men. Because when things like that happen to our wives, first off, it hurts us because they're hurt. Second, if we're not strong on our foundation of faith, how can we help them? And I remember going back, when did I do that fast? Was that May, June? I don't know, but it was amazing when you did. They, she likes it when I, I fast because I'm with the father and I get in better moods and I understand things more clear, let's be real. Uh, once the hungry part goes away at the end. You feel like you're going to die, but you're not. But there, were, there was a point in that week where I would get out of work and I would come here and I'd be here from 3 to three, 4 o'clock till 11, 10, 11, 12 at night. And she told me, she texted me one time, she's like, can you come home? I miss you. And I said, you can have me next week. But I'm with, I'm with God right now. But they need to see that in men guiding to the point where our wives need to understand that, or, or we need to understand rather that our wives, they're going to miss us. They're going to wish we would leave the church, not in a bad way, but we love each other. We got married. We like spending time. But when we put time away from them and put it with the father and put it with the spirit and fasting and praying and worship, your marriage is so much better. And that wasn't like a bad way, like our marriage was great before, but it got even better afterwards. And when we do that, we're able to be the strong foundation of faith that they need. Do you, do you guys get what I'm saying? Do men understand what I'm saying and why I keep pushing this? And because it's just so important that we lead and we're strong in faith because that's what they need. Anyways, back to I'm just going to read Psalms. So it says in Psalms 8, 2, it says, You have built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. If you have time this week, I triple dog dare you to read Psalms 8 about 50 billion times because it's absolutely amazing. But what he's talking in this, and, and we'll talk about and end with worshiping in spirit and truth, but... When he's talking about this, what they compare is the heavenly realms of how great worshiping in heaven is. And then, he com and then David compares it to a baby. But the reason why he's comparing it to a baby is because they're the first ones that don't know how to worship. It's a baby. They're the ones that are the most imperfect person to worship. And it's not about being perfect. It's not about doing it a right way. It's a baby can do it. You know what I mean? And so when I saw this and just the power behind, it, it'll shut Satan's mouth and it will silence the madness of those who oppose you. It's one of the, you have to like say it a few times to actually have it stick. But I mean, a baby can do it. <laughs> and then in John 4, 21 through 24, it says, he says, believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you won't worship the father on a mountain nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart, your people don't really know the one that they worship. We Jews worship, but out of our experience. From, it's from the Jews that salvation is made available from here on. We're, from here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but will be the right heart. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have a sincere worship, sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. Oh, I thought you had something. No, you I'm sorry. Um, and we need to understand, I know I keep saying we need to understand worship, but what it is to worship in spirit and truth. How many of us have heard about the author Rick Joyner? You may have or you haven't. Well, he has a series, and it's three books. It's the final quest, the call, the torch, and the sword. Amazing books for what's going on in the world right now and what's going on in the church. But there's one part of the call, the second part of the series, and he's in heaven. You know, the Lord still does that stuff. He shows people what's happening so that we're able to minister. And he wrote a book about everything he saw. But he's in heaven, and this is Jesus, the Son, talking to him about worship. And then I have something from Wednesday night that I wrote down about worship. So this is him. He said, I saw Jesus standing next to the Father, beholding the joy of the Father as he watched the little prayer meeting. So this, this man, Rick, when this happened, he saw a church worshiping despite everything going on. And he said, 
He turned to me, Jesus turned to him and said, this is why I went to the cross. Giving my father joy for just one moment would have been worth it all. Your worship can cause him joy every day. Your worship, when you're in the midst of difficulties, touches him more, even more than all the worship of heaven. Here, where his glory is seen, the angels can't help but to worship him. But when you worship him without seeing his glory in the midst of your trials, that is worship in spirit and truth. The Father seeks such to be his worshipers. Do not waste your trials. Worship the Father, not for what you will receive, but to bring him joy. You will never be stronger than when you bring him joy, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's the power of worship, where the Father himself, and earlier in that chapter, he, he talks about the Father was weeping. And he was crying, but it was tears of joy. And he stopped all of heaven to look on this little congregation. And he said, broken notes. Uh, last I checked, broken notes are like the most like perfect sounding. But it's when you worship and praise him at a pure heart, he will literally stop heaven and look at that church and the people in it and say, look, they're worshiping me. That's why my son died. That's why Jesus did what he did. So let's enjoy this together because they're your brothers, they're your sisters, they're your family, and I'm going to bring them back right here to do this forever. Amen. That's the power of what's happening when we worship. Um, I'm just going to say the point because it goes with what you're saying, yeah. and then you can say your thing. But uh, revival starts with worshipers worshiping in the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done for them. If you need to take a picture of that and put it on your phone, it's, I think it's one of those things to where do we actually have the revelation of who God is, what he's done, and are you actually appreciating him for doing that <laughs> and, and worshiping him in that reality? And when it comes to this, when we say spirit and in truth, I kind of told him, I was like, well, I feel like we say that a lot, but does anyone actually break down what it means? And when we say worshiping God in spirit and in truth, it simply just means in spirit means you're saved. You have God on the inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit. You are of one spirit. So you can worship in spirit. And then in truth means you're worshiping him for who he truly is. That is period. <laughs> it's those two things. You're in the same spirit and you're worshiping him for who he is. You know, and revival, all revival is, is God's spirit being poured out on the earth. He's done it. Azusa Street, back in 1910, I believe, they had their time. That's great. I was talking to the Lord. I was in here praying earlier this week, and I said, God, Azusa had their time. Kenneth Hagin had their time. This person had their time. Wigglesworth had their time. I'm tired of it. I want mine. <laughs> yeah. Because their stories are great, but I want my own stories. Mm -hmm. I want to go after him and say, look what God has done for these people. And he used, some, he used me. But because he used me, he'll use you. It's not supposed to just be the person up here preaching that hap this happens to. It's supposed to be in the entire body because we're all the bride of Christ. Some people just talk publicly. Yeah. But I can't go to your workplaces. No. I can't go to your homes at 2 in the morning. I, I mean, could, I could but depending on who you are, if you don't know who I am, I might not make it out. But that's what we're supposed to do. What would you say? I'm sorry. I said I could technically go to yours. Ken would probably fire me in a day. But your parents wouldn't fire me. Ken, yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so Wednesday night prayer, um, we just had a great time Wednesday night, I thought. And as we were praying, I was over there and I said, God, what do you want to say to your people? Because Pastor Joe was out of town, so I was up to lead it. Because God always has something to say to you. It's just whether or not you're actually going to listen to him. Let's be real. If you don't hear from God, that's not his fault. Um, so the line I just kept getting is the streets are filled with worshipers. How many of us have heard that? You know, Pastor Joe's been saying it for 25 years. You know, one attitude is, well, he's been saying it for 25 years. Nothing has happened. Well, another attitude is he's been saying it for 25 years, so now we're 25 years closer. And we strongly believe, and I've seen it in the spirit, and I can't wait to see it in person. This whole place is just going to be packed of people shouting and praising God. And oh, I'll share my dream after you're done then. Who God is. we got a couple minutes. Yeah. And then, so I started, and as I started, I stepped over to a simple form of what's called prophecy. Now, it wasn't fortune telling. It wasn't proclaiming heaven falling down and lightning and all this. Prophecy is speaking God's heart. That's all it is. 
And I, anyways, I'll leave that alone. Um, so God's heart, when I started saying, the streets are filled with the worshipers, this is what I could remember after I got done, says the streets are filled with worshipers, not people who can sing a good song or get emotions going and cause goosebumps, but people, but full of people who truly know how to worship. Because when people worship in spirit and in truth, they become one with the Father. If you're one with the Father and one with the Son, how can anything come against you, your house, or the bride of Christ? So when we truly worship, then the hearts of the leaders, the hearts of the people in the area will change. They can change. And then God will have his way on the earth. All revival, all that starts with his church worshiping him. And understanding, calling out to him, and being one with him in spirit and in truth. And it starts here. It's our job. The church has a job to do it. Worshiping him, understanding who he is, and that he just loves everybody. And he wants to be one with us. That's our job to tell other people. Do you all enjoy this this morning? You get something? Okay. Maybe you're looking at things a little different than when you came in here under the importance of worship. So... Let's pray real quick, then we'll do the offering. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, first and foremost, thank you so much for this day and what you said to these people this morning. And, Lord, I just want to give people an opportunity. You know, if you're watching by live stream or maybe you're in this room, if you haven't met the Father, you haven't met his son, Jesus, who we keep talking about and talk about how good he is, and you want to meet him today so that you can worship him and see your life change, just raise your hand real quick. Like a left, or right, center, left. All right, and then if you're watching by live stream, if this message reached out to you and same thing, you're like, I want to know that Jesus, I want to know that Father. All you have to do is truly just say it out loud, but believe in your heart, Jesus, I need you in my life. I know that you died for me. You rose again from the dead, and I want to see your glory fill my life from this day out. And if you pray that prayer, whether you're in this room or watching by a live stream and you believed it in your heart, you're part of the family now, which means you get to worship him the way we've been talking about. It's just that simple. So, Father, as we leave this place, again, we give our lives to you and we expect to see you in ways we never even thought possible because we're worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, the church said... Amen. Amen. All right. Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His Word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you.